Great, so welcome everyone again to the next lecture of, on probabilistic reasoning and machine learning. Today we talk more about distributions. Yeah? And also I will talk about models, whatever that is, and about MAP and ML, some acronyms that you might have heard already about it. So this is like about the MAP estimator and the maximum likelihood estimator. So we will talk about it and we will see how it fits into our framework, yeah? into the notions that we kind of develop, so how we can explain and understand what they really are. First of all, quick reminder, last time we talked about the Gaussian distribution. We had this univariate version of it. So basically it's a distribution for real valued random variables. Okay, and it's a very common one. Um, so this as an aside, The Gaussian distribution is a very common one because of Zentraler Grenzwertsatz, yeah, Central Limit Theorem, which you might have learned. Do you learn these things in MAFI or you don't? Okay, Central Limit Theorem or Zentraler Grenzwertsatz says if you have lots of random variables, whatever distributions they have, yeah, and you average them, then you will get a Gaussian distribution in the limit. So what does it tell us for practice? It means if you are modeling stuff in the real world, Yeah, where you assume there are many random variables involved, yeah, whether it's raining or not, or whether it's cold or hot or whatever, and they all have some weird distribution um, that might be very specific to the temperature or to something else. If you then average things and do measurements which are like the average of lots of different sources, yeah, if the effect that you're measuring is like the average of many influences, then it's reasonable to assume that it's a Gaussian distribution. Okay? So that's one story why the Gaussian distribution is so popular. Here's another one. It's also the so-called maximum entropy distribution. So among all random, random distributions for a real valued um, random variable um, that have a fixed variance of one, for example, the Gaussian distribution is the one with the maximum entropy. And you might not have heard the word entropy. It will appear again in this lecture. The short thing is you can equate entropy with randomness. So the, the variable that is maximally random is the Gaussian distribution. Okay? So that is another point of view why it's such a good choice. Suppose you um, don't want, you want to avoid modeling specific stuff in your data. So you take the maximum entropy distribution, the one that makes the fewest assumptions. Okay, so that's another reason why it's so popular. Okay, and the other reason is that's a simple one where you only have two parameters. You only measure the location, yeah, so a location along the infinitely long real axis where kind of the data is like distributed around, that's the mean, and the amount of spread around this location parameter, the mean, which is then the variance or the standard deviation. So it's a very natural description of some randomness, a very simple description of randomness. And um, we looked at the density function, okay, we even philosophized about the units of that one, that was more a bit on the hand wavy side, but it's important to know this equation and how it works, yeah? So if you see some equation somewhere, try to figure it out yourself or try to plot it and these kind of things, that usually helps. I always do that. So this is a one-dimensional version, but there's a multivariate version where you not only have a single real number, but you have like five real numbers or d real numbers, or you could also say you have a random vector instead of a random number, okay? And for that one, we also have a Gaussian distribution. And if you think about it, on the real line, a location is like one scalar, one number, and the spread will be the spread in one direction. Now in three dimensions, for example, the location will be a vector as well, so it might be this point over here, and then the spread is like, could be the variance around it, but we could be more specific. So we could have like a cigar shape, which has some arbitrary orientation. And so to describe these different cigar shapes that are possible, we need a matrix to specify the spread around this location. And that's why we have here a matrix, okay? Um, The, the challenging or scary part here is only that now we have some vector matrix, vector multiplications up in here. Yeah? But when you think about the sizes, as I said, this is a row vector times a matrix times a row vector, and that is a scalar. Or you can also call this, this is a quadratic form up there. And then it's again easy to apply the E function. 
The physicists among you, maybe they know that you can also apply the E function to matrices, but that's a different story. We don't need something complicated like this here, okay? And then there's this determinant down here, which was about the volume change. And again, this thing in front of here is like the um, normalization parameter, so it kind of makes sense that we are here talking about the volume, right? Because this part here tells us how much our data is spread out, okay? And kind of we need to inversely normalize with the volume. So if my, my data set is in a very, uh, taking a very large volume, then the probability density function value at each location should be really small because the integral over the whole space should be one. If I have a smaller volume, okay, so the determinant of my sigma is smaller, yeah, in that case, I don't have to normalize so strongly, so the values of my PDF should be larger, okay? So, with this kind of reasoning, suddenly the formula makes sense, okay? Question? I, uh, I, do, I do have one question. The normalization of this, we um, divide by 2 pi to uh, the, the nth root. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. The n here is the dimensionality of the data. Good point. It's not in here, so it should be an n-dimensional real-valued uh, vector. So it's an n-dimensional random vector. Um, please put it into the chat, and I will add it to the slide. Okay? Very good point. Yeah, so it depends on the dimensionality. And as I said, the integral over the whole space of the E function can be calculated with some tricks from complex analysis. And surprisingly, you get something with pi, okay? And the thing is, in 1D, you get something with pi, in 2D, you get something with pi squared, and so on and so forth. So the volume is increasing, and the pi gets an exponent, and that's why we have to take the square root, uh, the nth power of this pi thing, okay? So there is some reason, and you can also derive it. Again, stack exchange, the mass stack exchange is, is your friend here. Oh, it looks like my, my laptop always sleeps, um, but today I actually have something. I have my, where's my power plug? Oh, it's here, it's even plugged in. So why does it sleep all the time? I have no idea. Um, can I start the energy thing? What is it called, energy safer thing? It's not available this time, what a pity. Am I on battery? Charging on hold, rarely use battery. So what's wrong here? Uh, let me take it off and again in. So it's not charging for whatever reason. Okay, I have no idea. Okay, so it still thinks it's on battery. Oh no, maybe I have to click here. I talk too much without switching the slide. Okay, good. Okay, so this should work now. Now it should, should stay on. Okay, so far so good. So this is the Gaussian distribution. Of course, there are many other distributions. If we want to be more specific or if we have other data types, not real numbers, but maybe integers, and that's what we look at in, in the following, okay? Uh, but before that, the Gaussians has really nice properties. This is just a quick summary of some of the nice properties. If you have a multidimensional Gaussian and you marginalize, you stay Gaussian. If you calculate conditionals, you stay Gaussian. So everything is nice, okay? Similar like in linear algebra, where you can also have operations on linear mappings and they stay linear in certain situations. However, there's a whole zoo of distributions. So this is a big big chart which I copied from the link down here, which you cannot read. Um, so there's somewhere the, the, the normal distribution, which is up here. Yeah? So this is the normal distribution with parameter mu and sigma squared. And here are now arrows, and the arrows are transformation. So if I take normally distributed samples, xi, and I square them, then I end up with the non-central chi-squared distribution and so on and so forth. Many operations on these things and you get many different weird distributions. So we of course don't have to memorize all of this, but it should just show you that there's a whole zoo of probability distributions, right? And basically the errors are transformations. So the errors are functions like taking the logarithm or squaring or summing up to things or something, okay? And that generates new distributions. So, okay, so here's the link. So it's from, the, 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 um, from a paper from Jacqueline McQuesten and Lawrence Lemus, okay? And it's just univariate distribution relationships. So it was without multivariate, it was just univariate. Already lots of fun. 
So let's look at other distributions. So for example, distribution for waiting times. So that's the so-called Poisson distribution. Again, now the student question pops up. Do I have to memorize all of this? No, typically not. The Gauchy distribution is important. Here I just want to show you that there are other distributions, yeah? And how they fit into our notation. So the Poisson distribution is to count rare events, yeah? I think the, um, the typical uh, example is you have a radioactive material and you have a Geiger counter, and then like this bib of the Geiger counter, that's the waiting time between the next bib, I think that's Poisson distributed. No, the, not the waiting time, but the counts of your Geiger counter. I think that's Poisson distributed. So our random variable now has numbers from zero to infinity, so natural numbers, integers only, and the Poisson distribution is a distribution over that. So it's very different from a Gaussian distribution. There's one parameter, which is the rate, okay? The rate, large means there are lots of um, events, and a rate small means there are not so many events. Another example would be, let's say you're having a, a, a gas station, yeah, for fuel for, to where cars come, that to fill up their cars with petrol or with electricity, maybe. Um, so, and basically the, uh, the rare events could be that the discrete events are if a car comes, okay? And you could also model that with a Poisson distribution and then run a simulation or whatever. So we typically write it like this. You've seen this notation before. I have a random variable, and then I'm using this tilde sign, reading, being distributed according to a Poisson distribution with parameter lambda. So this poir of lambda thing is now not a PDF. It's more like uh, something for the distribution. Similarly, um, maybe to slightly confuse you, um, before, if I would say something is Gaussian distributed, I would write it like this, okay? And here now I'm overloading this letter N. We, before we're using it for the density of, of it, okay? So let's take the density, which is now P with a small x. If I want to do very precise, I put here a large x, okay? So for that one, we would say that it's also this curly N with an x, and then we put commas here. Or let's take the same one. So that's like one way to use it. Then I'm talking about the distribution with a certain parameter. This is if I want to use it as a density, right? Sometimes people also use a semicolon here yeah, to split the parameter with which it should integrate to one, or the number, the input, so basically the input for the variable, um, split it from the parameters of the distribution. Or Bayesians and I, I like it a lot to write it even with the bar because it's really like a PDF kind of thing. It's not normalized with respect to these guys, but it's normalized with respect to that one. And those can be also seen like random variables. But this is like a, mo a, a bit a non-classical point of view. So this basically means um, that there's a distribution with parameter lambda and it has this P uh, Poisson characteristic. We can also write down the probability mass function. And now remember there was a probability density function and for continuous variables that are, have real numbers as values and there's a probability mass function for discrete random variables like a dice or like something that can be counted, okay? But as you know, the density of some material has something to do with its mass, right? So you need to integrate the density and then you get its mass. And the same thing holds here too, right? So the mass of a dice may be one six to seeing a six or something, or a five or four, three to one. It's basically the weight that this event gets. And as you know, from continuous probabilities, we have to integrate some intervals to really get some non-zero probabilities. And basically, we are integrating densities, okay? And it's really like in a material where you would have a changing density in there. So it's the same thing. So, but now here for the discrete set, now we don't have a PDF, but a PMF. And basically, for every of these numbers now, I need to define the probability of seeing it. And of course, um, the summation of all of these guys here yeah, should be equal to one. But um, let me show you, so can I copy it by heart? So basically it's based on the fact that the summation of lambda to x divided by, ha, I think it was x factorial, right? 
Let's check it. I don't want to make it wrong. Yes, lambda x to x factorial, x being equal to infinity, that is another way of writing e to the x. Okay? And this is just something you memorize. I don't have to memorize it, but this is just a fact, and it's proven in infinitesimal rechnung Teil 1. Okay? It's just something. Okay, if that is e to the x, yeah, that is, oh, e to the lambda, so I did it wrong. Okay, so it's e to the lambda. Then everything is, then everything is fine, yeah? Because um, this is e to the minus lambda, that's the normalizing constant, which doesn't depend on x, and it's just normalizing it exactly right so that the whole thing is a density, or a mass function in this case, okay? Good. By the way, um, just my mistake that I did here, so putting in an x really doesn't make sense when you look at the formula because the x is, bound, is, is, is bounded here. Or, so the, 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 this is a binding operator. It binds the x so it doesn't appear outside of the summation. There is no x outside of the summation, only inside. So this is a syntax error somehow, okay? So it couldn't make sense. So there must be a lambda. Okay, so far so good. We can calculate the expectation and we can calculate the variance and surprise, it's equal to lambda. Okay, so the lambda is kind of like the average number that you get. However, the parameter lambda is a real number. So you could say on average, I have 2.5 cars coming to my gas station per hour, for example. Okay, and the other nice property is that the variance is also equal to the lambda. Okay, of course, you could imagine other distributions on the positive integers, yeah, where the mean is lambda, but the variance might be larger. Okay, those are non-Poisson distributions. The Poisson distribution, this is the case. Okay, another one is number of emails you receive every day is also Poisson distributed. Okay, you can try it. Yeah, take your emails and put them all into an Excel sheet, and then do the counting and make a scatter plot and try to fit a Poisson distribution to it. Yeah, it's, it's doable. Okay, waiting time between events. Okay, that's also, yeah, I'm a bit confused about that one because the waiting time is a real number. So let's skip that one. Okay, so that is an example of a non Gaussian distribution. Okay, here are other ones, more discrete ones. Distributions for tossing ties, dice. Maybe you're surprised that I'm distributions plural for tossing ties. The reason is I want to toss my ties not only once, but maybe several times, and my dice possibly only have two sides, right? And for all these special cases, there are special names. But in principle, we are tossing dice, okay? So here's the first one, binomial distribution. That's tossing a coin n times. And as you know, if you're a gamer, a coin is a D2 dice, right? So it's a dice with two possibilities. So if I toss it n times, then basically my random variable could count the number of heads that I'm seeing, okay? So it could be from zero to n. It's all possible. Um, then there might be a parameter that is important, the probability of seeing heads, and that's it probably, right? So there are two parameters here, the number of times I, cost my, I toss my coin and the probability of seeing heads. And if that's the case, then the x has a so-called binomial distribution, yeah? written as x is distributed according to bin n comma theta. And also here I'm using the other notation for the probability mass function, okay, putting a k in front of this. And there you have this binomial coefficient, okay? Actually, when I was a student, we had to make a, so, so a universitäts rally as an air semester, and part of the fun was that we need to go to the library and find the, the card, so they still had cards and no computers, and we had to find the card of some strange book from Alessandro Binomi with the title, My Formula, My Coefficients, and My Life. And the card existed in there, in the, cat in the official catalog of the university. So they, were, they had squeezed it in. Uh, they, you had to open like a long thing and put it in at the right location. And we needed to report back the, the signature. And of course, the signature was a binomial coefficient, right? So you couldn't put it into a computer anyway. I enjoyed it. Maybe you don't like these, these old stories from old men. Okay, fine. Okay, anyway, so again, let's look at it. So the k is the thing that we need to integrate out, to sum it out, okay? And it appears here and here. So here is not really 
a normalizing thing that we could drag out like for the Poisson distribution. So all of these are important. Now if you sum it up over all k, it's not so trivial that this sums to 1. That's a bit more surprising, right? It's, you, you can get to it by counting, okay? So because here you're only looking how many heads you have and how many tails you have, but you're not looking at the order. So it doesn't matter whether you first have five heads and then five tails, or the other way around, or one head, one tail, one head, one tail, one head, one tail. But all the possibilities are basically these n over k, okay? So that's where it comes from. So it's a possibility to see five heads among n tosses. Okay, so that's where it comes from. The thing is, um, why do I know that? Because when I see a formula, I want to understand its parts. Okay, and that should be your attitude too. I think it's super useful. And the other thing is then just, okay, if you see k times heads, take theta to the k. And the, bottom, the last part is the other side is 1 minus theta, so you take it to the rest, which is n minus k. So that's where the formula comes from. Okay, it also has an expectation, and it's n times the theta. Okay, that's interesting. So if I um, throw um, my coin, a fair coin with 0 0.5, if I throw it 50, uh, 100 times, and I would sum up the number of heads, I would expect on average 50 heads, right? There's also a certain variance, and the variance is also increasing with the number of times I toss my coin, okay, which is curious. And then there's this other thing here, which is looking more strange, right? So it means, but let's think about it. Let's say theta is 0.5, okay? Then this function 0.5 times 0.5, it's 0.25, okay, small number. But what happens if I put a, a 0.9 here? Then I have 0.9 times 0.1, and that is 0.09, so a much smaller number. So if we plot this, so let me plot the theta times 1 minus theta, yeah, you will get something, you get a parabola, right? So it must be a parabola, and it will look like this. So you will have the maximum at 0.5, and at all the other numbers it's going down, yeah? Right? The, the, in the, you know it's a parabola, we know that one, we know that number up here, and we know if theta is going to 0, the whole thing goes to 0, and if theta is going to 1, the whole thing goes to 1. So it must look like this. Does it make sense for the variance? Any ideas? So does it make sense? Is the variance smaller if I have theta equal to 0 0.1 or 0 0.9? Yeah? Uh, it would seem to make sense because if we have uh, theta of 0.5, that means that both outcomes are uh, as likely as the other one. Right. Yeah, right, exactly, because there's not so much randomness in there, right? So if it's 0 0.9, the coin is less random. I said randomness today already. One can also say the entropy is much lower, okay? So the entropy of a, of a fair coin is maximum, maximized, and the entropy of an unfair coin is much smaller, yeah? You can also think about Borussia Dortmund playing against Schalke 04, okay? And you don't know the outcome, yeah? Let's say you are 10 years ago, maybe it was a fair coin that you throw, and it was like 50-50. If you throw the coin now, it's very biased, yeah? So it's very clear who wins and who will lose. And so if 10 years ago there was a game, Schalke against Dortmund, then in the news, the information content of who won was one bit. So it was a lot of information. There was a lot of entropy. But today, if Schalke plays against Dortmund, the information content of the news, whether Schalke won or not, is very small. So it's smaller than one bit, okay? And this is all about entropy. We will talk about entropy later, okay? This should just whet your appetite. Okay, curious, so, so it makes sense, right? So the formula is nice, great. Um, let's now go one step back. So the binomial distribution might be one that you know. What about if I toss a coin only once, okay? Also, that one has a name, and it's called Bernoulli distribution. Okay, this is now a special case of the binomial one. Let me just 
flash everything at once. It's always the same point. Now we have a random variable in 0 and 1. Okay, it's like tossing a coin once. They're still the same parameter. The other parameter is gone. Okay, so we have Bernoulli with one parameter. And we can also write down the probability mass function here. Where now I'm here using this notation, um, using my, my nice Iverson brackets. Okay, so if x is equal to 1, the Iverson bracket is 1. If x is equal to 0, the Iverson bracket is um, 0. So of course, I could also say theta to the x. So that would be another possibility. And 1 minus theta to 1 minus x. But I think with the Iverson brackets, it's even more clear, in my opinion. OK, and this is all like special case of our binomial distribution. So the Bernoulli theta is equal to the binomial 1 and theta. And again, if you like Haskell programming or this kind of thing, this is a nice declaration, right, to define a function. So you defined already some code for binomial NP or N theta. And now you define a Bernoulli object, and you just define it like that. Yeah? So that's really cool. OK, what else can we do? I talked about dice, right? So the natural thing is now that we throw a k-sided dice n times. And also that one has a special name, and it's called a multinomial distribution. Okay? And now this gets a bit more complicated, and it's so good that we understood the details of the other ones, because now we just need to generalize it to more sides. Okay? The coin only had two sides, now we have several sides. If you only have two sides, you only count the number of heads and the total count. If we have six sides, I need to write down all the different outcomes. So I need a vector of length k. Of course, actually I need a vector of k minus 1 if I know how often I throw it. But for simplicity, I take a vector of length k. Okay? And that one just counts how often I've seen a certain outcome from 1 to k. And the sum of all these entries must be equal to n, right? since I throw it n times. Let's flash through the rest. So what do we get? OK, our parameter now is also a vector. Yeah, OK. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. Because if you have a, a six-sided dice, for example, a loaded dice, yeah, which always shows a 1 and not a 6, OK, then basically you need for every side you need a different probability. Yeah, so you need all these numbers. But again, we have this constraint that the summation is 1, so you only need all of them but one. But for completeness and for nicer notation, you better write down all of them. Okay? So theta j is the probability that we see side j on the dice. Again, we have a notation with two parameters. This is like, like the binomial distribution, but now it's basically a generalization. That's why it's called multinomial distribution. So by like two, multi like many. And also we have a probability mass function. And now this is just a generalization of the formula that we've seen before. But we have this weird looking binomial coefficient. And you can guess how it's called. It's a multinomial coefficient, right? So it's just a generalization of it. So it's now not the question how many zeros or how many tails you could have in a sequence or how many possibilities there are to put five tails in a sequence of 10. But now it's the question if you have a sequence of 10 dices, how many possibilities are there to put there two twos, uh, three, two, uh, three ones, and four, four nothings, and blah, blah, blah? So you get the idea. So how many permutations are there of these possibilities, of these possible outcomes? So it's just a generalization of what we've seen before. And the definition is also just as nice. For the binomial coefficient, we typically have n and k, and then we have n minus k. Yeah, but when you think about it, n minus k is the rest. and so. This is really the natural way to do it. OK? So far, so good. So understanding the other formulas helps us understanding this formula. So now there's one thing missing, which is um, throwing it once. So let me, before I show you that one, let me show you the multi-nulli distribution. And now this is a made-up word. Um, I have it from this book, MLPP. So this is, I think, the book. I, I mentioned it at the beginning. I think it's machine learning and probabilistic something, OK? Um, and they invented the name Bernoulli multinulli, OK? So that's where the name comes from. It's not common, so maybe the statisticians department, they don't know it. Of course, this is all the same as before. 
Yeah, it gets the name cat because often it's also called a categorical distribution because we have like k different categories. What does it have to do with machine learning? Why weird? Why do we know all this? Why do we need all these distributions? Yeah, you need it, for example, for the MNIST handwritten digit data set, right? The labels, they have a multi nulli distribution, right? There are 10 different outcomes, 10 different categories, or 10 different classes. And your prior assumption could be that they are all equally likely. Yeah? Or maybe you know this, there are some fancy uh, logarithm laws that the one is much more likely than the two, than the three, than the, and so on and so forth. I forgot the name who came up with that one. Uh, I can look it up if you ask in the chat. Anyway, <coughs> so that is the same thing, but now just throwing it once, OK? Um, it's also sometimes called discrete distribution. OK, I omitted one slide. So what was on the slide? On the slide before was the mean and variance of the multinomial distribution. And that's a bit messy, so that's a more complicated case now. Let's just look at it a little bit. So the mean is simple, so that is just the same as we had for the, bin for the binomial distribution. Ideally, now, um, for the variance, um, we only have a single number, but here we not have a single number because we have a multivariate distribution, right? So the distribution was for a whole vector of integers, okay? So we will also have a covariance matrix in this case because we have a vector. It's a multivariate distribution. Okay, and it can be shown that basically the entries, they look like this, and the minus signs, they are kind of funny, right? They are surprising, or they surprise me. The entries on the diagonal are just the ones that we had before for the single ones. So why are those things sleeping? Is it a, is it a setting from here? My, my laptop did not sleep. No, whatever, OK. You have to tell me when it switches off and you don't see anything. OK, on the diagonal, we have the special entries. But on the off-diagonal, we have the covariance between two things. And if you think about it, if I see lots of fives, the probability for twos goes down, right? So if I see one of the categories very often, the other ones must be smaller. And that's why they are negatively correlated here, OK? But don't worry about the details. This is really already getting very deep into something. But it can be understood, OK? And ideally, it makes things more clear. OK, so far, so good. So what did we get about tossing dice? First of all, we can toss the dice n times, a k-sided dice, and we had the multinomial distribution. And then there's a special case for n equals 1, and there's another special case for k equals 2. Okay? And then there's a special case for n equals 1 and k equals 2. And those are all the distributions that we've just seen on the previous slides. Okay? Actually, a better way to put it is to put it like into a matrix like that. Okay, so this is the summary for tossing n times a k-sided dice. Great, so far so good. Um, let's say we have a data set. Now, how do we choose parameters, right? So that's now the next question. Let's say you have your gas station and or your or electric power or something for your electric cars or whatever, and now you want to estimate the, distrib uh, the distribution, the Poisson distribution. You need to estimate the parameters. So how can you do this, right? Are there algorithms or general mechanisms that we can use? There are, and they're typically called estimators. And in statistics, what people do is you typically write down an estimator, which is then a function of the data that you observe. Okay? So for example, you observe that yesterday there were 10 cars, the day before yesterday there were 100 cars, the day before, 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 there were 25 cars, and so on and so forth. And so your estimator takes these numbers and calculates lambda. Okay, so that is an estimator. However, sometimes in statistics, the estimators, they fall from the sky. And then you prove properties about them. Yeah, you can prove unbiasedness, in German, Erwartungstreue, or you can prove that they have the, the, the most power. Yeah, the Erwartungstreue Schätzer mit maximaler Stärke, or I don't know, there are some names, some fancy abbreviations as well. Um, but sometimes you can also get these estimators not just by being super clever, but you can also derive them from some more general principles. And that's what we are looking at now, OK? So let's first look at this. Um, ah. Ah. 
Ah, okay, sorry. So I thought now we come to the estimators. But before we get to the estimators, I want to talk more about the parameters. Sorry for the confusion. Okay, so um, the question is not what parameters should we choose, but if I would have read my own slide, what distribution should we choose for the parameters? And let me give you a little bit of context to that one. So here already I said that I like the notion that those are like random variables, okay? So they are also, if I, if I only have data, I don't know them, right? So I don't know mu and sigma squared. And I would like to see them as random variables. But if I want to view them as random variables, I should also give them distributions, okay? So I need distributions, some clever assumptions. Why could that be nice? Because let's say I have such a distribution. Yeah? I could multiply it with the likelihood, OK, and divide by the evidence. And then I get the posterior distribution using Bayes' rule. OK? So it would be nice if we would also have like nice parameter, uh, li nice distributions for the parameter so that we can do the math. You can already guess probably what is a good prior for the mean if I have a Gaussian distribution. Any suggestions? What, what distribution should we use? Yes. Ah, OK, that is an estimator. Yeah. I, I don't want to be Bayesian, yes? A Gaussian as well, yeah. But you're right, you can average all your data, and that is a good estimator, totally. And that is the best estimator in, in a certain context. But here I was looking for a nice prior distribution that I could plug in here. And so I could say, OK, my x is distributed according to, let's say I only want to estimate the mean, and I'm assuming a certain variance. And I would say my mu is also distributed according to some Gaussian distribution. OK, why is that a good choice? Yes? Because you multiply two portions, the result is Gaussian. Very nice. OK, so you got that message already. Very nice. Yeah, then the mass gets very nice, right? So what about the bottom part here? Um, the bottom part, we don't have to worry too much about. Is it just the normalizer of the whole thing? OK, so multiplying two Gaussians will lead to another Gaussian distribution. And then that's like super useful because we can um, just work with the parameters. And one possibility is if we have several of those, uh, let's say n, then we could average them, like you said. And that would be a good estimator that we can derive from such a formula, for example. Okay, and we will in a couple of slides. OK, so it's interesting to think about the question before we talk about estimators to talk about distributions for parameters. Let's take another model. We had this model already with the glasses, the beta binomial model. Did I call it beta binomial model already? I think I did, yeah? So there are two parts here, beta and binomial. And binomial is this thing of tossing a coin n times. And that is like, observing people wearing glasses or not. That's like tossing a coin. There's an unknown probability theta, and I'm doing it n times. And then there's this better thing here. And the better thing, I think I mentioned already in the lecture, but let's look at it again. So the better now is a distribution for our parameter, OK? So the story is we flip repeatedly a coin with unknown heads probability theta, or I observe people having glasses or not. Um, I count the number of people wearing glasses or seeing hats, and I have the total number of throws. Um, then I could model it like that. I would say that the k given theta, so k given the fixed parameter theta, is the binomial distribution, n comma theta. And the theta is distributed according to a beta distribution. Okay? Now this looks completely random. Why use the beta distribution? That was looking so complicated. The thing is, I want to have a probability distribution on the interval between 0 and 1, OK? So I, if I have a Gaussian distribution, for example, for the parameter, that's not a good idea because it also has some possibility to be smaller than 0, to be larger than 0. So I want to have a distribution yeah, that is somehow cleverly parameterized 
such that I'm only between 0 and 1. And the area under this thing should be 1. Okay, and the better distribution is one possibility how to do it. So it has the right properties with that respect. However, it has ni additionally nice properties. If you write down base rule, yeah, like up there, and we would have here the parameter A and B, and um, here we have our beta distribution. Uh, no, here we have our parameter theta, and here we would have our beta distribution with parameters a and b, then basically um, we can also derive the posterior in closed form, and it turns out to be a beta distribution as well. So that's what I've written down here. So if this is my assumption, so this is my model assumption, I can derive in closed form the posterior distribution of theta given that I've seen some number of glasses or some number of heads. And it's a better distribution as well. Okay? And that's why the better binomial model is so nice. We call this um, that they are, it's a conjugate prior to the binomial likelihood. Okay? So the better distribution is a conjugate distribution to the binomial likelihood. Where conjugate means that the prior distribution and the posterior distribution have the same parametric form. Yeah? I will use the word conjugate more often today, ideally, if I get far enough. So let's look at the parameters. So I have some starting values, a and b, yeah? and now the updated distribution will be a plus k and b plus n minus k, so b plus the other examples. So it looks like um, the a is like the prior telling me how much stuff I'm already seeing. Yeah? So for example, if I'm Assuming that most people wear glasses, my, I would have a random estimate, yeah, 20 will have glasses and five people won't have glasses. So I put my parameter A to be 20 and B to be five, okay? And then I get new data, and so I will overrule the 20 and the five with my new data. Maybe I've seen 1,000 people now wearing glasses, and I'm seeing uh, whatever, 10 people seeing not glasses, yeah, then this will update the parameters of the beta distribution. Okay, what happens if the A and the B gets larger and larger? Let's say this is the beta distribution for uh, A equals whatever, 1 and now uh, maybe 1 and B equals to 2. So there's a slight shift to this side. Okay, now if I have more examples, what would we expect? Somehow, the uncertainty about the parameter should get smaller, okay? So I will get one which looks like this, and this will be the resulting better distribution after I see more data, okay? So by increasing A and B, yeah, the variance gets smaller. That's the property of the better distribution. And um, that's also something that you've seen in the demo, that kind of at the beginning I had a uniform distribution. I think the uniform, I think you have with a equals 1 and B being equal to 1. With these parameters, you have the uniform distribution. And then once you have observation, the thing gets more and more narrow. Okay? So it's all working very nicely. Even though beta looks like an arbitrary choice, it's one which really nicely makes sense. Now, just as an aside, this thing over here is just a different notation for the same thing. So this P of theta being equal to blah is basically redundant with what I wrote on the, on the left-hand side. Where is it going? Do I have press buttons? Okay. And similarly here, it's just redundant. Um, as I say, both notations are fine. Okay, so this is a better binomial model. Let's also have our table for our better distribution. So this is now the same shape of slides, like for multinomial and so on and so forth. So I have a random variable theta now. Looks like a parameter, but now that is the random variable. And it's coming from the real valued interval from 0 to 1. So any number is possible. Okay? There are two parameters to the beta distribution. And in that case, it's written like theta distributed according to beta AB. And it has this density function. Wow, this looks very much like one that we've seen already, right? Didn't we have the binomial distribution? It was looking quite similar. It was something like theta to the k and 1 minus theta to the n minus k, okay? And this is very similar. The k was the number of heads, 
and the n minus k was the number of tails, and here now also the a, okay, there's a minus one for whatever reason, but that's the number of tails, and that is the number of heads. So it's very similar. Um, however, now this thing in front changed, so this now looks more weird. And here's the thing that is different. For the binomial distribution, the theta was the parameter, so it was on the right-hand side of the bar, yeah? But it was also theta to the k, but here now the roles are switched. Now the theta is the random variable, and so I need a totally different normalization factor in front of it. However, it's not totally different, it is related to the binomial coefficient. So let's look at this. So this is a beta function. And I thought I never will experience things like gamma function and beta function, which I, I learned in infinitesimal rechnung. It was one of these topics where they wrote down an integral, and I thought this integral is not solvable. So what should we do with it? And I didn't understood that they then just invent a name, and they just call it gamma function, or they just call it beta function. So it's just a name for a complicated integral. So can you guess? What's the integral formula for b of r comma b is? Can you guess it? Think about the role. So why do we put this guy in front of it? So it doesn't involve the random number. So it's a constant scaling factor, right? So it's a normalizing scaling factor. So beta of a comma b is exactly the integral of this stuff back here, integrated out with respect to theta. So that's how the beta function is defined. That is the weird-looking integral. It's the one, integrate this stuff in the bag. So the beta function here, there's no magic about it. It's just a name for the, for the normalizing factor. But we don't worry about computing it, okay? If we ever need it, we say from NumPy import beta function, and then we use it, okay? So we don't worry about it. Um, it also has a nice form in terms of the gamma functions. That's fun, okay, interesting. Um, I think there's another slide which shows it more closely. Actually, this beta function here yeah, um, is very related to the binomial coefficient, the other way around. Yeah, when you remember in the binomial distribution, we had n over k, but now we have 1 divided by the beta function. So somehow they are like 1 is the other way around. And that's exactly what it is. So if you take the binomial coefficient of m and n and you write it out, you get something very similar like this stuff up here because the gamma function is a continuation of the factorial function. Right? The factorial function is like an awfully fast-growing function, super, super fast, but it's only defined on the integers and the gamma function is generalizing that for all real numbers. Okay. This fact can be used and plugged in here, and then we see that the beta function is really a generalization of the um, binomial coefficient. And guess what? There's also a function which has an m here. Like, there's also a generalization of the multinomial. And I'm sure you could derive the formulas now just by generalizing these formulas. Yeah? That's possible. Okay, anyway, so what else can we say about the beta distribution? It also has a mean, okay, and the mean, how does it look like? It looks like we are just taking the number of heads divided by the total number, okay? So A plus B is like the total number of stuff that we've seen, and A divided by A plus B is like the, um, uh, the, yeah, the normalized number of heads that we've seen, okay? And there's also more complicated looking variants, and I need to press the button again. How do I get this back? Is it, is it off? No. Right. Now, it's, now it's back. Okay, great. Okay, I don't know. Am I the only person having this problem? I don't know. I, maybe it helps if I switch on the projector in the middle? Whatever. Let's do that. Okay, and it also has a mode. So what is the mode? A mode is a maximum. Okay? Typically, we think the mode is equal to the mean, right? But that's not true, right? It's only true if you have a symmetric distribution like the Gaussian then the maximum is also the mean. However, if you have like a, a skewed distribution like that one, yeah, then there, the maximum is at one location, but there's too much mass over here on, on the other side, and so it's not at the same location. Okay, so far so good. 
Let's go on. So we generalized from tossing coins. It looked boring from binomial to multinomial. It was just new distributions. But of course, we can also do it now for the beta distribution, right? We can generalize it to more outcomes. And that is the Dirichlet distribution. Yet another famous mathematician, Dirichlet, I guess he's French. This is now the distribution over the random vector theta 1 to theta k, which was exactly the parameter for our multinulli distribution, for our dice. Okay? And let's spell it all out. So it's all just how you would expect it. So there are really no surprises here. The only difficulty here might be the, the new B function here, the new beta function, because that one takes a vector. The alpha is a vector now. But it's just the, the generalization of what we've seen before. And again, you could write down an integral for that function by just integrating this product. And I don't want to solve it with integration by parts or product rule or anything. That looks like a big mess. And looks like nobody likes to do this. That's why you give it a name. Okay? Then you don't have to worry about the integration anymore. By the way, how are they implemented in NumPy? So there must be some super clever person who, who solves this integral, right? No, actually they are implemented like tabular lookup. So typically you just store all these numbers. And then you interpolate between two of them. So that's how you calculate it. Yeah? Um, so it's the same way as engineers were calculating these things 100 years ago with having tables. So that's how these complicated functions are calculated. Great. Special cases are always fun, right? So the Dirichlet for A and B is the same as the beta distribution A and B. And now guess it, if there's a beta binomial model, there must be a Dirichlet multinomial model. And it shouldn't surprise you. And there is one. So, OK, here just a note. If I'm starting with a beta prior and I'm ending up with a beta posterior, the wording is the prior and the posterior have the same distribution. That is very nice. I tell you in a second why that is very nice. In that case, we say the beta distribution is the conjugate prior for the binomial likelihood. OK, I think you know all the words. So let me tell you why it's nice. It is very nice because. Today's posterior is tomorrow's prior. Okay? So tomorrow I see more data. And so if after today I end up my day with um, get another button to press. Okay? If today I end up with a new beta distribution, tomorrow I make new observations and I update my beta distributions. And then on the next day I see even more data and I again can update my beta distribution. Okay? Now the good thing is, um, even though the background formulas are so difficult, Suppose you write a toolbox for these distributions, right? You can keep it on this level, right? You could say, OK, you have a random variable with beta, blah, parameters A and B, and this is your observations. I tell you what the outcome is. It's just A plus K, B plus N minus K. So that is the only computation that you need to do in such a toolbox where you use conjugate priors, OK? And of course, people have written these kind of toolboxes. Here's the, the scary looking directly multinomial model, but by now it should be a piece of cake, right? Simple, right? It's just like going from a coin to a dice. It's the same thing. Yeah? But you need the Dirichlet distribution. So far, so good. OK, and I also create these slides just by copy and pasting, right? I mean, this is just copy and paste the other slides and changing a few keywords. And then after a few iterations with students, the typos are gone, yeah, ideally. OK, so far, so good. Quick digression. I talked about it already. The Gaussian-Gaussian model, right? Beta binomial. There must be a Gaussian-Gaussian model. Yes, we've seen it already. So the prior is Gaussian. The likelihood is Gaussian. And I've wrote it down for several observations. Sure, possible. And then the posterior is also Gaussian. And those are just the formulas that we've seen last time. OK? So it fits nicely into the story. And the same sentence applies about conjugacy. There's a whole website. Let me click on it. So there's a whole website on conjugate prior. OK? And how does it look like? It looks like a big, super big table. So there's a likelihood. Let's say you have Bernoulli. There's a conjugate prior distribution, a sense of beta distribution. And then those are the posterior hyperparameters. Poisson, wow, Poisson likelihood also has a prior distribution, which is conjugate, the gamma distribution. And that's why the gamma distribution exists. So if you start with the gamma distribution for your rate lambda, if that is your prior information, 
Yeah, your posterior will have now these updated parameters. And so on and so forth. Yeah? So it's a big list. And I think someone must have done a Python toolbox out of this. Yeah? If not, you can make a bachelor thesis about it. Yeah? So that would be something nice and useful. OK, very good. Let's continue. Um, so this is a summary. Uh, we've seen all of that already. OK, fine. Blah, blah, blah. So there are distributions on the outcomes called Bernoulli, Multi, Nulli, and uh, what were the other? There was binomial, and there was multinomial. And then there are distributions for the parameters, ideally conjugate priors. Otherwise, you don't want to do this. You don't want to do the integrals if they are not conjugate. And those were the beta and the Dirichlet distribution. How can we get a point estimate? So that was where, I was, where my brain was already like uh, 15 minutes ago. Now, how do we get estimates for these parameters from what we just learned, OK? Um, of course, um, you can guess it already. Um, those are already estimates, aren't they? No, they are not. Those are distributions. So here the answer is not, um, let's say I'm doing this example with the glasses. The answer after that experiment is not theta is equal to 0 0.7, but the answer is theta is distributed according to a beta distribution with a being equal to 70 and b being equal to whatever, 60 or something. OK, so that is the answer. A point estimate now gives me a single number for my parameter theta, OK, so 0 0.7. Do we want that? If you are um, like a fully fledged Bayesian, you say no, the, the posterior is the answer. Okay? That is all I can say. The point estimate is only screwing it because should I take the maximum or should I take the mean or should I take the median? Right? Those are all different estimators for these parameters. And as it turns out, throwing a bit more math at it, you can get all these things that I just said and derive them by using loss functions. OK, how can I get a point estimate? So let's start with the map estimator and the maximum likelihood estimator. So let's denote our data with this letter D, curly D. It could be ZK, for example, in the bi better binomial model. So a point estimate is a summarization of my posterior. OK, and there are different ways I can summarize it. There's a so-called maximum a posteriori estimator, the map estimate, and that says maximize the posterior distribution. Yeah? So look where the mode is. Okay, That's one possibility. That looks very similar to the maximum likelihood estimator, which is saying just maximize the likelihood and ignore the prior. Right? The maximum likelihood estimators, they are non-Bayesian in a way. So I'm not assuming a prior. And when you look at them, they are very much almost doing the same. The only thing is that here I'm factoring in some prior knowledge. However, in the example with the glasses, I started with a beta prior, which was like uniformly distributed on the interval from 0 to 1. So in that case, it's like multiplying a 1 to my likelihood. So it doesn't have an effect. So it was, at the end, the same outcome as if I would have done maximum likelihood. Okay? So there are interesting relationships between the two. In particular, if I see lots of data, yeah, then my data term here is a product of many likelihoods, and it will dominate the whole thing. So if I have lots of data, the map will converge against the maximum likelihood estimate. And that can be also shown more mathematically with convergence in probability, or convergence in distribution, or convergence in something else. Okay? Um, both estimates ignore the variance of the posterior. Yeah, what is this statement saying? Yes, both summarize my posterior distribution, but they only summarize it, so they're losing information, right? And they both only give me a single number back. That's it. Yeah? Um, however, often it's very useful. Yeah? In particular, let's say you have a practical, you are collaborating with some biologists or with some physicists, and they now want to know what is this parameter. I want to have a point estimate. I, I don't want to have a distribution. And then you say, OK, sure, I can give you one. Here's the map estimate, or here's the ML estimate. Here's the famous ML estimator for Gaussian likelihood that we can now derive. OK, so at the end of the slide, you will maybe recognize a nice estimator that you've seen before. So suppose we have 
Gaussian distributed data points, yeah, coming from some distribution where the i here now is the identity matrix. So that is the, like saying the covariance matrix is equal to one. Uh, so it's the identity matrix. We want to estimate the mean. Let's start with our maximum likelihood estimate. So we will write the parameter mu sub ml, where the ml now stands for maximum likelihood. So this is a particular estimator. And we say it's the arc max of this thing. By the way, the max right, of this expression is the value of p of blah, the maximum possible value. The arc max will give us the mu, which is maximizing this expression. Right? Are you all familiar with max and arc max? Yeah? If not, please ask or ask in the chat. Not familiar? OK. Yes or no? Yes? Not familiar. OK. So let me just very quickly show you what this thing is. And I try not to go over time, though. So let's see. <coughs> so suppose I'm having. Um, Whatever, let's take a parabola, some function. OK? So this is f of x, and this is x. And I would like to find the maximum. Yeah? Then, for example, I, I would write it as maximum of f of x, um, maybe even more precisely in terms of x. Right? So the maximum thing is like the summation sign. It's also a, a variable binding operator. Yeah? if you like this. So what am I calculating here? Suppose my maximum is equal to 10, OK? And the location is 5. Then the maximum of f of x is equal to 10. So far, so good. But sometimes I want to see where is the maximum. And then I would say I take the arc max with respect to x. And again, this is a variable binding operator, the x is not free anymore, and here the result is 5. That's it. OK, so I think this picture explains it. Sometimes, OK, this is a bit weird definition, right? Because huh, maybe the function goes like this, and there are two maxima. So this might not be uniquely defined, the arc max. So you sometimes have to be careful. OK? By the way, there's also some calculus. Um, so the arc max of whatever lambda times f of x, yeah, in terms of x, is the same as the arc max of f of x. Right? You can drag out the lambda and remove it, because it's like a constant factor. However, the maximum of lambda f of x is not equal to the maximum of f of x, but it's lambda times the maximum of f of x. And danger zone, so you have to be careful, maybe with the sign of lambda. So maybe sometimes. So let's say lambda is greater than 0. And I now don't want to think about lambda smaller than 0. Okay, But sometimes a maximum turns into a minimum or something. Yeah? So OK, so far, so good. Also here, um, this also probably assumes that lambda is greater than 0. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. OK, so far, so good. So here, I'm now doing this calculus thing. So I'm having the maximum of my likelihood. I can put a logarithm in front of it, sure. Why am I allowed to do it? Because the logarithm is a monotonically increasing function. If it, if it would be a monotonically decreasing function, uh, things can go wrong. But if it's a monotonically increasing function, the location of the maximum is not changing. So I can plug it in here. And then I plug in the definition of my density, which is this guy over here. And now I'm doing some logarithm rules. So logarithm of a product is the summation of the logarithms. Nice. Um, and the, the logarithm of um, this constant times the logarithm of the E function is the logarithm of the constant plus the logarithm of the E function. And since this is just a constant factor in front of it, I can just omit it under the arc max. And next, I can, um, the log and the E disappears. 
And so I have Arcmax of summation of minus one half of these guys, and now I'm dragging, I'm, I'm removing the minus one, and I do this by turning the maximum into a minimum. Okay? So there could be a whole calculus behind this Arcmax, but typically I don't have the calculus, so you have to do a little bit of thinking what kind of operations you can do under the Arcmax and what operations you can do under the maximum. Okay, what did we derive? We derived now the maximum likelihood estimate for the mean, and it turns out to be the method of least squares. Okay, nice, isn't it? Because typically people are doing least squares for fitting, right? Yeah, least squares is good. You can differentiate it, and it's, yeah, why not, why not take it to the power of two, right? In a way, it's totally arbitrary, and a deeper reason is you could say, okay, you are using the method of least square. I could model it probabilistically. That means that you have a certain assumption how your data was generated. So you're assuming Gaussian errors. Okay. But again, thinking of Zentraler Grenzwertsatz and saying the errors are the summation of lots of random stuff, and that's then by Zentraler Grenzwertsatz or Central Limit Theorem Gaussian distributed, using method of least squares is a very good choice for most of the time. Okay? But this is giving us a justification of using it. It's like saying my data is Gaussian distributed or the errors are Gaussian distributed. Okay? So I like it. Okay, naming convention. So MAP stands for maximum a posteriori, and MAP estimator yeah, for a particular parameter is a function of observed data, which then allows me to calculate an estimate for theta. Yeah? And similar for ML and ML estimator. Sometimes we write MLE. That's why I have this slide. Sometimes it's confusing. So people write, so you have a map estimator or an MLE estimator, and then this is like, ah, syntax error, so there's an E too much, okay? But don't worry too much about it. Here's some further insights. Um, the ML is minimizing the negative log likelihood, okay? Whew, let's think about it. So I have the arc marks of this um, Density, I can put a logarithm because logarithm is monotonically increasing function, and then I could put a minus sign and change it into the minimum. Okay, and there we see that the, as a minimizing the negative log likelihood is the same as maximizing the PDF. Why is it worth mentioning? Because like the negative log likelihood has a very nice form for the Gaussian, it's just the least square. Yeah? The log likelihood gets rid of the exponential, and the minus sign gets rid of the minus sign. So far, so good. The map can be seen like a regularized maximum likelihood. Maybe you've heard the, the word regularization. So that's typically when you have an optimization problem, which is not converging so nicely against what you want because of small eigenvalues or some other things, and then you regularize. And here we see that regularization can be seen like a Bayesian type of trick. So suppose I write down the map estimate and do some similar stuff. Let's rewrite it with base rule and get rid of a constant. So this thing is constant with respect to theta, so I can omit it under the arc marks. And then I'm putting the logarithm in here even, and maybe using the negative log likelihood trick here, then I'm seeing that the map estimate is basically minimizing the negative log likelihood, so that is telling me something how well the data fits my parameter, and some other term which only depends on the parameter. And that could be, for example, a regularization term. And if you heard about L2 regularization, L2 is the, the two norm of a vector or something, that comes for free if you say my theta is Gaussian distributed, because then the, the, the density of the theta is e to the minus theta squared. And if you take the negative log likelihood, you will have the norm of theta squared, okay? So next time you see someone is doing L2 regularization in such a problem, then you know, ha, huh, we can also understand it probabilistically, so we are using a Gaussian error model, and you're having a prior on your parameter, which is a Gaussian distribution, okay? So here's more fun with this kind of thing. So um, in particular, often there's a question, how do you weight your regularization term? So there are often a magic number in front of it, right? So a hyperparameter to tune. With this kind of derivation, we can derive the numbers. What's the right parameter? What's the right interpretation of the regularization squeezing factor, tuning factor? So if we assume a certain variance for our prior mean yeah, and a certain variance for our measurements, and we go through the mass, 
Then it turns out that somehow the regularization just has this factor lambda in front of it, which is the ratio between the sig sigma and the tau. And this is similar to a signal to noise ratio. It's the inverse signal to noise ratio, because the sigma square is measuring the noise in your measurements, and some of the tau is some information about the signal. Okay? So that's kind of interesting, right? Doesn't help you choosing the factor automatically, but it gives you some additional insights what they really mean. Also, it's curious when you compare the estimator. So the maximum likelihood estimator for the Gaussian situation is the mean, like one of you mentioned before. So that is the maximum likelihood estimator, and you can derive it from this formula by taking derivatives. And if you do the same with this regularization, we get this 1 divided by n plus lambda. Huh, that's interesting. Because that now means, so the map estimate is the same as the maximum likelihood estimate, but assuming we have lambda additional observations of zero. Okay? So it's like saying, I've seen the zero lambda times. And this is, of course, what is the effect? It's kind of pushing the estimator towards the zero. Okay? So that is the effect of this kind of regularization. Okay, so far so good. You are still with me? Otherwise, you have to ask questions. Okay, so there's a nice interpretation now of the map in relationship to the maximum likelihood estimate. So for choosing lambda equals 1, yeah, that's like adding one additional observation, x being equal to 0, and then do maximum likelihood estimate. Lambda equals 2, you have two older observations. Lambda equals 100, or noise to signal ratio being like 100, yeah? And it's like having 101 older observations. So this must be 101 observations. Okay? Please tell me in the chat that I need to change this to 101. Okay. So we see that the maximum likelihood MLE is like MAP. Okay, great. So I made the mistake myself. So the ML, ML estimator is like the MAP estimator. Okay? For lambda equals 0, which corresponds to an infinite tau. So an infinite tau corresponds to a very wide Gaussian. So the, the prior is very unspecified. Of course, you can't normalize it really for infinity, but, but you get the idea. So our parameter lambda here plays a similar role than A and B in the beta distribution, which were all like, also like previous observations. OK? Good. Now, which estimator should I choose? Should I choose MAP or should I choose ML? OK, so that's still not answered. I only showed you connections between the two. So, and for that now, we need Bayesian decision theory. OK, so now are uh, further interesting things that you can do. So, Bayesian decision theory turns priors into posteriors to update your beliefs. Oh, no, no, sorry. So in Bayesian decision theory, your first step is to turn your prior into a posterior, um, into a posterior distribution, OK? To update your beliefs, it's a fancy wording to say, in the morning, you have some prior assumption about your parameter. Then you do experiments and collect data. And then in the evening, you updated your beliefs, because now you have a new posterior distribution, OK? So that is this, what you typically do. How can we now convert beliefs into actions? OK, that now means, how can I get a point estimate? And this can be done by defining a loss function. And the loss function will tell us, being wrong, how expensive is it? OK, so for example, if you um, make a, create a plane, and you have to estimate a parameter, so how bad is it if the parameter is 1 meter off, or 10 meter off, or 10 kilometers off? OK. And depending on that, you will choose different estimates, right? For example, um, oh, I'll give you examples in a second. So we need to define a loss function which compares our pick parameters, our estimate, theta hat is the estimate, with the true one, where theta now is the true one. So that is our loss function. Because then now we can say, OK, I have a posterior distribution, I'm Bayesian, and now I integrate it against my loss function. And then I would say, that is my expected loss. So if I have a particular estimate, 0 0.5 for my parameter, I can then calculate how much on average I will have to pay if I believe that my posterior distribution is that what I wanted. 
Okay, so far so good. So, and this thing, minimizing this expected posterior loss is a so-called base estimator. And that is now an algorithm, right? So you start with defining a prior and a likelihood, deriving a posterior distribution, then you do your observations, you get your posterior distributions after having the observations, and you need to calculate this integral against your loss function. And then minimizing that one gives you a definite number. So let's look at examples of the base estimator. So a common loss function is the zero one loss. It says you pay nothing if you're right and you pay one dollar or one million dollar if you're wrong. Okay, that's the zero one loss. Um, if you calculate the integration and derive the base estimator, we don't do it, but if you do it, it turns out you will end up with the map estimator. Okay? And the map estimator was the one that takes the maximum of your posterior distribution. Here's another one. Suppose you have a quadratic loss, which means, yes, if I'm a little bit off with my estimator, it doesn't matter. That's fine. But if I'm off too far, I nonlinearly want to penalize. So if I'm off by one meter, I pay one euro. If I'm off by two meters, you have to pay four euros. Okay? So I'm having a squared loss function. In that case, the base estimator will turn out to be the posterior mean. Yeah? You can do the math. I think that one is easier possible. And then there's another one, the so-called robust loss, which replaces now the L2 norm here with an L1 norm. Okay, so it's just the absolute value between the one, and then it turns out the base estimator is the posterior median. Okay, what have we learned? It means if someone says, um, I like Bayesian inference and I always take the posterior mean, that's my estimator, then you can say, okay, so that means your loss function is the squared error. So that's your loss function that you have optimized. If you actually have, want to optimize that one, you better take the median, okay? Um, I think this is an example. So there's this famous machine learning conference, NeurIPS, and there are these big hotels in the US where you have like five elevators, and you don't know where to stand because you want to minimize the way to, to walk to the different elevators. And it might be a simple problem if the elevators are like this. Yeah, where do you stand to minimize? Stand right here, right? and then it's minimal, the amount to walk to the next elevator. However, what if this elevator is standing over here? Where should you stand then? Okay, that's now not so easy, right? So intuitively we would say, ah, we should go a little bit over here. But when you think about it, I choose to be, for example, at this location, and now what do I have to pay for this one? I go this way. What do you have to pay for that one? I go that way, or that way, that way, or the long way. So what I have to pay is the L1 norm between the true one and the wrong one. So it means you better take the median. So the answer to this question, where the elevator is here, or the elevator is in Alaska, yeah, is to stand right here. This is minimizing the L1 norm, and that is the one that is relevant for this elevator problem. Okay. So there are situations where you want to take the median. Great. So blah, blah. So that's all there. What is still coming? Oh, there's so much coming. I don't want to go over time, but I want to cover the, the seller, the selling problem from eBay, yeah, because that's a fun one. OK? So I go over time again. Sorry. I work on it. I, I, maybe only five minutes today. So what else can you do with the posterior? So we see you can have point estimates from your posterior. How do you get them? You take the base estimator and combine it with the loss function. Yeah, we've seen that if you take the 0, 1 loss, your base estimator will be the, the map estimate. Okay? When you take the posterior mean, that's the right answer when you take the quadratic loss. Taking the posterior median is the right answer when you minimize the L1 loss. Okay? So that's what we just learned. What else could we do with the posterior? Because like a fully-fledged Bayesian, like a religious Bayesian, I say, no, the answer is the posterior. I don't want to, I don't want to calculate the number. 
So now, what else can you do with the posterior? So why don't you want to calculate the number? Because sometimes I'm not interested in the parameters, but I want to do prediction. Yeah? What does it mean? So um, let's say my task is not to calculate theta being equal to 0 0.7, which is the probability of wearing glasses in this class, but I want to predict what is the probability that the next person entering the room wears glasses or not. So I want to do a prediction task. And I don't care for the, for the right parameter, right? I don't care, right? I, I just want to minimize the error in my prediction of the next data point. So let's write this down, OK? So um, this is the posterior predictive distribution. And it looks very similar to the one with the loss. So it involves an integration. So let's go through it step by step. So first of all, my posterior now, so this is p of theta given that I've seen some data, it's expressing my current belief state. Okay, that's also some lingo we sometimes like to say about the world, which could be expressed as a particular beta distribution. And I don't care for the true parameters at the end. Okay, I don't care for the true theta. All I want to do, I want to make predictions for the future, so I want to predict new data, but I don't care for theta, okay? So what I could now define is a so-called posterior predictive distribution, which is the probability that the next data point is equal to 1, given that I've seen the data. And in this expression, there is no theta, okay? So where did it go? I integrated it out. So let's write it out, yeah? So let's introduce the theta in here, yeah? So we have now p of x equals 1, given theta, uh, comma theta, and the data. So how is the step going from here to here? This is just the sum rule, OK? So having the joint distribution of x and theta and integrating out the theta, I'm getting just the one with the x. OK, so far so good. And going from <coughs> this one over here, I'm using the product rule now. And now what did it buy me? So it gives me the following. So this term here is now my, can I mark it? I can't mark it anymore. So this term here is my posterior distribution, yeah? And the term in front if, is yet another likelihood term. It is the likelihood term for my future observation, yeah? In the Bayesian decision theory, it was the loss function. Now it is the likelihood term for tomorrow, okay? So what is, assume that I know the exact parameter. What is the probability of seeing someone coming in with glasses? So that is expressed in here and I integrate it against all possibilities of the parameter. And now this is taking much more information from the posterior than just taking a point estimate. So this is taking all possibilities into account. Yeah? Okay, so far so good. Um, this is the example for the posterior predictive distribution for the beta binomial model. So I just skipped over this, but those are exactly the same formulas you've seen already several times, yeah? So the map estimate has some certain numbers to calculate it. It's similar to calculating a mean, kind of, right? But one can derive the exact form of the mode of the beta distribution, basically, right? When you go on the Wikipedia page for the beta distribution, they typically report the mean, the variance, and the mode. And the mode is exactly the map estimate. And then there's the maximum likelihood estimate, in this case, just k divided by m, n, OK? And now, if I take the maximum likely estimate for a certain data, I get some result, but I cannot get the posterior predictive distribution, because for that one, I need the posterior one. And if I plug everything in and I do this carry integration, I will end up with the so-called posterior mean. So now, this posterior mean is surprisingly the same number as the, the mean of the posterior distribution, but it doesn't have to be like that. It's only the case because here the likelihood is only the theta. If this is something more complicated, it could be anything else. OK, I'm still promised you that we will get to the online selling example, OK? And it will be related to what I just said. Here's the example. So you might ask, OK, the example with someone tomorrow coming in with glasses or without, yeah, boring. Yeah. Do I really need it? Can I, can I use it in practice? Um, yes, you can. So here's the story. 
So two seller at a, at a big company selling stuff, I should also change this slide. Um, suppose they have the same price, yeah? two companies. Now, however, one has 90 positive reviews and 10 negative reviews, and the other one has two positive and zero negative ones. So which, from whom should you buy, right? And I guess intuitively you are Bayesian and you would do it right, right? So you wouldn't buy from the one who only got two positive and zero negative because you probably think, oh, this might be a fishy company who just appears and disappears, right? Doesn't have li lots of credibility. Um, if you would apply maximum likelihood, you would say, right, I should buy from the second run, right? Because the maximum likelihood estimate of um, getting a positive comment is 100%. So that's a great result. That's a 1.0 for the CETA. And for the other seller, I only have 90 positive and 10 negative, so that's a 0 0.9. So the point estimate would tell me um, that the second one is better than the first one. However, our intuition tells us that our estimate for the 0 0.9 has a much smaller variance because we've seen much more data than our estimate for the 1.0. Yeah? So we see that the variance of our estimate should play really a big role here for our decision. So now this can be modeled by having two beta distributions. So here's one beta distribution. Yeah, I'm assuming before I haven't seen anything, I have a uniform distribution on the parameter for seller one. That's why I have this plus one parameter over here. Yeah? And after seeing 90 positive and 10 negative, my posterior about reliability will be this beta distribution. I can just write it down. You never have to write the integral for the beta function or something to do this. The computations are really simple. And for the other one, I have that one over here. And now the actually probability that I'm interested in, what is the probability that theta 1 is greater than theta 2? And this is now a Boolean statement of which we could calculate the probability. And we have to integrate it against these two beta distributions. And curiously, when you do this, you get 0 0.71 as the result, OK? So you should clearly buy with the first one. OK, if I go five minutes over time, I still have one minute. So you might think that this is super difficult to do with all these beta functions. And so this is so nasty. They were, they were so complicated formulas. But actually, it's super simple. How do you do this with so-called numerical integration? So what we are doing is we generate samples from this beta distribution, we generate samples from the other beta distribution, and we count the number of times that theta 1 is greater than theta 2. And if you do that and average it over many samples, you get 0 0.71. Okay, so that's how you solve this super complicated integration. You just generate lots of samples for theta 1 and theta 2, yeah, but always pairs. So one theta 1 is one theta 2, another theta 1, another theta 2. And for each of them, you, you check whether theta 1 is larger than theta 2. Okay? And then you integrate it up, and you get 0 0.71. OK, and that's it for today. So transformation of variables we will do next time. Okay? But I think this should be enough to do the exercise sheet. Again, thanks for your five minutes extended ex uh, attention, and I'll try better next time. <laughs>